Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. On June 29th at 2.30pm Mountain Standard Time, I will be hosting a special Zoom history conference on the Bar Colony expedition that would eventually found Lloyd Minster. It's a fascinating story, one that's really, really interesting and I think you'll all enjoy. Registration is $10 and you can purchase your registration through my website at canadax.com. That's E-H-X. Also, you can support the podcast by going to Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada E-H-X. It is well documented that the Vikings arrived in North America five centuries before Europeans began to arrive in droves. The Vikings and their time in North America was brief, but it forms an interesting look into a culture from the Western Hemisphere and a culture from the Eastern Hemisphere meeting each other for the first time. This episode isn't about the Norse and their settlement in North America, but rather their interactions with the indigenous who were already there. Before I dive in, I will apologize now for any mispronounced names. I also want to state that nearly all the information for the interactions between the Vikings and the indigenous comes from the sagas, written after the events happened, so some of the things may be true, other things embellished upon. One of the earliest tales of European and indigenous interaction comes from the tale of a Viking trader who arrived in the court of King Alfred the Great in the 9th century. The Viking named Othair told of a long voyage to the edge of the White Sea, where he was furnished by people he called the Sami, with otter and marten furs and bushels of soft bird down. The Viking trader then gave the king walrus ivory. According to the Icelandic sagas, Specifically, Eric the Red Saga and the Saga of the Greenlanders, the Norse were exploring the lands west of Greenland for some time after establishing settlements there. In 985 AD, a merchant named Bjarni Hershofsson was blown off course from a migration fleet of 25 ships, and after three days of sailing, he hit upon land. Now, he was only interested in finding his father's farm, but when he returned, he told about this land to Leif Erikson who would explore the land in more detail and eventually help put down a small settlement in 1000 AD. Three lands would be described on the voyage of Leif. The first was Helaland, which means stone land or land of the flat stones, and today is believed to be Baffin Island. In the saga of Eric the Red it said, They sailed away from land, then to the Bear Islands. Thence they sailed away from the Bear Islands with northerly winds. They were out of sea two half days. Then they came to land and rowed along it in boats and explored it and found there were flat stones and so great that two men might well lie on them stretched on their backs from heel to heel. Polar foxes were there in abundance. The land they gave name to and called it Helluland. The saga also says that Leif described it as a worthless country with great glaciers and it seemed to be like one great slab of rock. It is also believed, based on what was said in the sagas, that the Norse explorers made contact with the Dorset culture that lived there, described as skraelings in the sagas. The origin of the word skraeling is not known, but it is believed it comes from an old Norse verb that means ball, shout, or yell. Some also speculate that it comes from the word skra, which means dried skin, in reference to the skins worn by the indigenous. No cultural ramifications for either side have been suggested by historians. Yarn from archaeological digs on Baffin Island also seem to correspond to yarn found in Norse settlements. Further digs at Baffin Island have found tally sticks, signs of iron and bronze working, and whetstones. The theory states that the Norse wanted walrus ivory and furs. The Dorset wanted metal and wood. Dorset carvings of people who had long noses beards, and prominent eyebrows were also found during excavations. Some historians believe that the Vikings actually stayed on the island for an extended period and traded with the Dorset people. None of this has been confirmed totally, and the theory is somewhat controversial as a result. The Dorset culture was a Paleo-Inuit culture that lasted from about 500 BCE to about 1500 AD, preceding the Inuit culture. The Dorset would be displaced by the Thule, who had begun to rise in Alaska 
and are the ancestors of today's Inuit, and spread east to Baffin Island. Archaeologist Pat Sutherland spoke with CBC back in 2012 about her findings in the Arctic. Professor Sutherland, would you describe what you found on Baffin Island? Yeah, um, there's there's four, uh, four sites. There's one main location on South Baffin, which is where we've focused our efforts because the evidence uh, initially from there was more compelling than from the other sites. There's a site in northern Labrador, there's a site on North Baffin, and one in Frobisher Bay. Um, We found a variety of artifacts in places where Dorset people, these are the people who were there before the Inuit in the Arctic, uh, where Dorset people had camped and lived. We found artifacts that uh, were outside the range of what we know of Dorset uh, technology. And there are three main categories of artifacts. There's cordage that has been spun. Is this Um, like wool or something? Well, you could call it that. Think of pieces of yarn in your grandmother's knitting basket, um, like that, Uh, two-ply cordage. It's spun from wild animal hair, um, the material from the North American sites. Um, In Greenland, uh, most of the the cordage is spun from uh, sheep and goat's wool. Um, but there is one uh, textile fragment that has cords in it that's made out of Arctic hair fur, similar to that which we found on Baffin. And then another category that shows up at all of these sites, over 1,500 kilometers of coastline now from North Baffin to Northern Labrador, is uh, tally sticks. They're wooden sticks that have been notched. They're quite comparable to finds from Norse sites in Greenland, in Iceland, the Faroes, even as far as Novgorod in in Russia. These were common in Norse sites, used for recording trade transactions. How long do you think that they were there, the Norse? I I think over four centuries they were back and forth. We've got to remember that the voyages to the coast of Canada would have been for the purpose of exploiting resources and uh, exploring new areas to exploit resources. So they'd be back and forth by ship. Would any of them stay the winter? Um, it, at Lancel Meadows, from the saga accounts and from the archaeological remains that are there, it appears that they did overwinter there. We don't have any clear indications of that um, as yet anyway for, for uh, South Baffin. Uh, and at the moment, South Baffin, the location in South Baffin, is the only location where we have strong uh, architectural evidence that suggests that the Norse were, um, had established a shore station there. The second land described was Markland, which was never recorded to have been settled, but was a common spot for Vikings to go in order to harvest timber. It is suggested that Markland was Labrador, but the particular area has not been pinpointed. The name of the land, Markland, means the land of forests, and for the settlers in Greenland, where there were few trees, Markland would be a welcome place to harvest. While there was no permanent settlement, the saga of the Greenlanders state 160 men and women settled in Markland for winter protection around 1010 AD. The last and most famous landing spot is Vinland, and today it is the only known Norse site in North America outside Greenland, found at Lanza Meadows on the northern coast of Newfoundland. Leif Erikson was the first known European to set foot on Newfoundland, staying the winter and making no contact with the indigenous. In 1004 AD, Thorvald Eriksson sailed with 30 men to Vinland to spend the winter at the camp his brother Leif had built years earlier. The expedition would find no signs of people initially, except for on, what the sagas say, on one westerly island where they found a wooden stack cover. In the spring, Thorvald found nine indigenous sleeping under three skin-covered canoes and attacked them. The ninth indigenous was able to get away, and soon the indigenous came back to the Norse camp in full force, killing Thorvald with an arrow that passed through the barricade the Norse had put up, although some say he was on his ship when the arrow hit him. According to the sagas, there would be brief hostilities, but the Norse would stay for another winter and leave the following spring. In the saga, the following is said, I have been wounded under my arm, he said. An arrow flew between the edge of the ship and the shield into my armpit. Here is the arrow, and this will cause my death. The Norse were able to keep the indigenous away with their swords, but with the death of Thorvald, the Norse returned to the coast 
and buried him with crosses at his head and feet. This would make Thorvald the first known European to be buried in what would one day be Canada. Five years later, in 1009 AD, Thornfinn the Valiant supplied three ships with livestock and 160 men and women to go to Vinland. After landing at the Viking settlement on the island, Thornfinn began peaceful relations with the indigenous there. The indigenous offered furs and grey squirrel skins, while the Norse offered milk and red cloth. The sagas state that when the indigenous saw the milk, they wanted to buy nothing else. The indigenous, according to the sagas, tied the cloth around their heads, and Thorfinn forbid his men from trading their swords or spears. In the sagas, the indigenous are described as such. They were short in height, with threatening features and tangled hair on their heads. Their eyes were large, and their cheeks broad. According to one story in the sagas, a bull that belonged to Thornfinn stormed out of the wood, startling the indigenous, who got into their boats and rowed away. They would return three days, although some accounts say three weeks, later in force, and are described as hoisting a large sphere on a pole that was dark blue in color and the size of a sheep's belly that flew over the heads of the Norse and made the sound described as an ugly din. In the attack, it is stated that the Norse retreated to a defensible position, and at the end, many of the indigenous were dead and two of the Norse were slain. The Norse apparently retreated, and Freydis, the half-sister of Leif Erikson, who was pregnant at the time, was not able to keep up with the retreating Norse. She called out to them, stating that they should stop fleeing from, as she said, such pitiful wretches. She then grabbed a sword off the body of a dead Norseman, took out a breast, and struck it with her sword, frightening the indigenous who fled into the woods. Thorfinn then came back for her and praised her for her courage. Another account says that the Vikings had killed an indigenous man who, who they claimed was trying to steal weapons. The Vikings chose to leave, stating in the sagas, Despite everything the land had to offer there, they would be under constant threat of attack from its prior inhabitants. The sagas go on to say that the Vikings realized that even though this was good land, their lives here would always be dominated by battle and fear. Heritage Canada did a Heritage Minute on the Vikings arriving in Newfoundland, which I will play here, although it is pretty light on dialogue. think this is? Helga and Honestina Ingsta proved that the Vikings were by centuries the first Europeans to visit this continent. With that, the experiment in Vinland was over somewhat. Eric Knupsen, the Bishop of Greenland, would make an expedition out to Vinland in 1121 AD and returned a year later. The main reason Vinland didn't succeed, among others, was that the indigenous were more numerous and knew the land better while the Vikings were stretching their resources being there. In addition, while the Vikings had iron weapons, their level of technology was not that much more than the indigenous, and much less than what would be seen in 500 years when the Europeans arrived with guns and bringing highly infectious diseases with them. The indigenous would also tell tales of the Vikings who had briefly arrived on their land a thousand years ago. The Inuit would say, Soon the kayaker sent out a spear in good earnest and killed him on the spot. When winter came, it was a general belief that the, and I'll pronounce this the best I can, Kavdrunate would come and avenge the death of their countrymen. The word Kavdrunate was the Inuit word for foreigner or European, and the Greenlandic word Kualak, which is similar, means Dane. Interestingly, based on DNA analysis, 
it was found that 80 living Icelanders have a genetic variation similar to the one found in the indigenous people in North America. It is believed this variation entered the Icelandic bloodline around 1000 AD, when it is believed that the first Viking indigenous child may have been born. It is believed, but not confirmed, that an indigenous woman sailed from Newfoundland to Iceland during the period when Vinland was active. The DNA lineage, called C1E, is passed down through a female, and the unique gene is present in four distinct family lines in Iceland, found during a decode genetic study. The Inuit do not carry the genetic variant, and there is nothing in the sagas that speak of an indigenous woman going back to Iceland. That being said, the saga of Eric the Red tells of four indigenous boys who were captured and taken back to Greenland. Today, 80 individuals in Iceland carry this gene. Now, while the settlement only lasted a few years, it is believed that the Norse made trips to Markland for timber and to trade with the local indigenous for as much as 400 years, stopping just prior to the arrival of France, England, and Spain to North America. Scrailing Island in the Arctic has evidence of chainmail, a boat rivet, an axe head, and more, dating between 1160 and 1440 AD, well after Vinland had faded from use. Norse cloth dating from 1043 to 1413 AD has been found on Rune Island, and this shows that there was likely extensive trade and interaction between the Inuit, Dorset, and Vikings. The last official mention, though, comes in the Icelandic annals, stating that a ship made a voyage from Greenland to Markland in 1347. This is the last mention of a voyage to Markland. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Canadian History X, and if you did, please give a rating and review. You can support the podcast at Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. And you can email me with any questions you have at craig at CanadaEHX.com. And you can visit my website where I have hundreds of articles on Canada's history. Just go to CanadaEHX.com. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.